Welcome to the Time for a Reset podcast. I'm Arthur Nasser, and I'll be hosting the new segment, Inside Marketing Transformation. In this podcast, we'll have insightful conversations with marketers who are managing and leading change in their organizations. Welcome to Time for a Reset, Inside Marketing Transformation. Today, I'm joined by Nathan Wadlow, Head of Digital at Virgin Wines. I'll hand over to you, Nathan, for a quick introduction to our listeners. Yeah, I'm Nathan, Head of Digital Marketing. Um, also look after PR as well at Virgin Wines. I've been at the company now for four years. And yeah, it's been a bit of a whirlwind. So I was brought in way back in August 2018 to essentially digitize the company to, to a degree. They, they, they kind of made decent strides, but not fully invested in digital marketing, even though they are an e-commerce business. So yeah, I was really, really brought in to, to, to fast track and accelerate the digitization of the company. I've built up a team from one to five, and we cover all areas under the sort of digital marketing and, and PR banner, which you'd which you'd expect to see. So yeah, really pleased to be on, and um, yeah, looking forward to talking about what is uh, yeah something I'm very passionate about and 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 changing all the time. It is, it is, and you must have you must have so many things to get on with. You know, team of five covering all of digital marketing. You've probably got your work cut out, haven't you? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, really, really proud of the team which we built. They're, they're all great. But yeah, it's just the pace of change and, and, and kind of all the new channels which we're looking at. We are also working with kind of external specialist agencies as well. So yeah, we do we do juggle a lot within within our relatively small team. So yeah, it's huge, hugely exciting, hugely challenging, but um, always plenty to do. And as you say, marketing is constantly changing. Some of the legacy stuff still around. You know, you probably see it, you know, more than others. You know, if you if you had to reset one thing in marketing, what is it that you that you'd love to have this big red button that just goes reset um, and it resets it? What would that be? I think it'd just be a, a greater ability to hit that button, just to pause and just take stock and 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 kind of classic kind of situation analysis kind of kind of processes with with, with how you work, how marketers work. And the main reason for that is because digital transformation has been hugely fast paced. The acceleration of change has been phenomenal the past few years, certainly mm-hmm. since I've been working in the digital space. You know, I'm still relatively young. Um, but yeah, it's just been a crescendo in terms of the speed and in, in which businesses and, and marketers have had to adapt to change. And with that, you know, obviously it's exciting, but it brings challenges too, right? It's, it's, it's really hard to, to keep abreast of everything that's going on all at one time, particularly when you manage multiple channels, which we which we do. And then throw into the mix a load of macro headwinds, which we've got at the moment, you know, just come out wow. of um, a two-year two year lockdown straight into yeah. a cost of living crisis and all sorts of social kind of implications of that as well to consider. Yeah. So you throw those two things together and you're in a very challenging environment, which is constantly changing, has has huge impacts on how businesses, yeah, adapt and work, really. Um, so we've gone from longer term planning to certainly shorter to mid term planning. And, and yeah, it's difficult to, um, yeah, as I said, kind of hit that pause button and, and take stock and sit back and really analyze things. So I think that's a really, it's a really interesting answer, actually, Nathan. Usually, you know, people think around one or two areas of marketing that they that they want to change. But mm. in your world, you're kind of thinking, I just want to be able to spend a little bit of time to take stock, plan things out properly, have a look at what's going on, be able to respond, be able to sort of look backwards a little bit, build the data, and then and then kind of go forwards in a well as structured a way as possible, and probably in as proactive rather than constantly having to react to you know a google announcement or a meta mm. announcement or something new that just come in or you know this roas just crashed yesterday what was that all about <laughs> and, you know all of the sort of the various things and the various channels there's probably what you're trying to you'd love to get two months three months to just right leave me alone in a room and i'll come <laughs> back to you with a really solid marketing plan but then that's likely to change as well, right? What, what good intention? Exactly, exactly. You know what we what we plan today might 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 not be quite correct in in six months' time, and that's that's just the world we live in now. I think, which is yeah, again, it's exciting, it's challenging, and I think it, it probably makes us better as marketers, you know. And and I'm sort of seeing this more, and I'd love to get your view on it. Speaking to the importance of marketing and, and how the role of marketing has shifted. You know, it used to be that marketing was planned on an annual basis, and then everything just runs. You can't, I don't, you know, I don't think you, at least within digital, three to six months is, is is a very long time. Is marketing becoming more about creating more flexible organizations, more agile organizations, rather than here's just a, a marketing plan for, for a year, especially within digital? 
and seeing that this ever-changing landscape and the change is really, you know, it's it's dictated by the consumers, isn't it? I mean, that's where the change, you know, technology and consumers mean that you have to you have to behave differently in a sort of an advertising environment, right? Is is that the sort of the genesis of of what keeps us on our toes? Absolutely agree. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. I also think it, it it depends on ultimately what you're trying to achieve at, at that given moment as well. We we have found ourselves in a position where we've probably well we've always been very performance marketing based, mm. and with that naturally points towards certain channels where you allocate yeah. money spend right. Yeah. So at the moment, because we're in a difficult trading environment, many e-commerce businesses are feeling it. Our kind of media strategies have shifted more to okay where do we know that we can get the biggest bang for our buck to a yeah, degree yeah yeah so with that you know that that might mean that we scale up search advertising pull back a little bit on paid social pull back on programmatic advertising which is a bit more branded that kind of thing so yeah you're totally right it is driven by the consumer but in turn i think it also is, is massively dictated by where, where the business is currently and at, at that given moment as well and, and ultimately what we're what you're trying to achieve and then, and and with that marketing's role, you know, you've been at you've been at Virgin Wines for what in in a marketer's in a marketer's world at least is is two lifetimes. Um, <laughs> you, you, you've been there over four years. What have you seen in terms of the change? You know, in, in the position of marketing or the importance of marketing? You know, over that period. Certainly, with, with, with the kind of data which we now have access to, particularly in the digital mm. space, I think it's, it's, it's no doubt grown in importance. I think COVID really was the epitome of that. We yeah. use, we we have access to fantastic uh, competitor intelligence tech, and and you, you, you can assess in in in, in quite granular detail the, the movements in terms of your competitors and how to spend, who's doing what, and when, and all that kind of stuff. And that's been really invaluable for us to sort of again going back to situation analysis and how important that is to kind of assess things kind of make our own decision on what's right and you know when to strike when to pull back all that kind of stuff so yeah. i see in my experience of virgin wines digital marketing yeah. and 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 the platforms we have access to have kind of been the barometer almost in terms of what's going on yeah. you know looking at quite simple things like you know search demand on an ongoing basis you know wine delivery as a search term went from about yeah. maybe under ten thousand searches in the uk on average a month to about nearly two hundred thousand overnight wow so that's a huge shift obviously so we we were laser focused on search demand for and still are but mm-hmm. particularly during covid for a number of months and and, and and years to a degree which was then fed back to the the you know the board external board internal board ceo who i report to so we, yeah as i said we're all that that's a barometer in terms of what's happening has certainly become more important in, in my experience for sure yeah yeah and and how do you create and you said that you know one of the, one of the things that you are trying to do and working on is this kind of essentially digital transformation making the organization more digitally focused extracting the most value you can out of digital by improving systems processes operations etc which is you know i don't think any organization ever gets to the perfect system or the perfect setup um it's an ongoing process isn't it it's non-stop absolutely how you know how have you thought around positioning or being able to keep up with those things so let's say that demand goes from ten thousand to two hundred thousand. that happens pretty quickly in a consumer's world doesn't it but from a you know from a brand it's not that easy to react to it very quickly i mean you know from from the outside people will think okay just just x20 or investment in search but it's not that straightforward is it no, it's really not. And I think um, we were one of the fortunate businesses for sure when, when COVID struck, but with that, it, it, it certainly brought challenges as well. So our IT roadmap, for instance, is, um, it, it, you know, we're, we're four years in advance. We know what is happening over the next four years to cater for increased demand. And, and fundamentally, we're, we're, we're nearly double the size, you know, today than what we were three, four years ago. Wow. Okay. And the infrastructure remained the same. <laughs> So um, okay. yeah. not saying that the wheels are falling off, but there's, there, you know, there's, there's certainly areas which we know yeah. that we need to kind of really invest in in, in order to, um, yeah, to, 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 to be the business of the size that we are today and, and hopefully grow in a really successful and positive direction moving forward as well. So, and that, that's, that's really broad infrastructure, you know, that's, that's our commerce platform, warehousing technology in terms of being able mm-hmm. to keep up with demand and all that kind of stuff, you know, efficiency around that, you know, with, 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 with you know, say number of staff members that we have managing these respective areas, et cetera. 
it's, it's continually changing. Um, one area which we're really focusing on a lot at the moment is, is as I'm sure many businesses are, is, is, is first party data and, yeah. um, and and how to get the most out of that, you know, and that yeah. that, that is a big job, you know, that there are many different areas which, which that touches. And um, yeah, you've got to have your finger on the pulse and be both reactive and plan as far ahead as you can. But yeah, we do, we do quite a good job of it. And on on that first party data piece, and, and obviously, you know, you can you can divulge as much as you're comfortable or able to do so, but I'd love to get from you an understanding or a, or a picture of, you know, what are you doing in that first party data space? What does your work look like? What are the challenges? You know, how far along in that journey are you really? And, you know, how do you draw, how do you draw that journey out? How do you map out where you are in that journey? Because it's, it's actually fairly ambiguous, isn't it? It's, you know, there isn't a, a process or a system or a playbook that says, right, this is where you are. You've got to figure that out yourself. I think we've got a pretty good understanding of what we need to do in terms of where we're at. We, you know, we, we, it's kind of reactionary as, as well, I guess, you know, to, to yeah. the likes of, you know, the, the situation with cookies, obviously, if you don't react to it, you, you, you're going to be in a lot of trouble in, in, a, in a year or two's time, unless it keeps getting pushed back more and more, but who knows? <laughs> <We> never, <laughs> yeah. You never know these days. Yeah, it's strange. We're, we're utilizing it as best we can. So we've got, we've, we've got a really good data warehouse and function, which um, we actually probably rely, rely on more so now than we do kind of in-platform metrics. You know, particularly GA, you know, uh, certainly in the performance marketing, looking at very sort of last touch point direct response stuff. Mm-hmm. We use our data, back end data systems now to do that, to, to get kind of the true view of, um, okay. but anyway, it, what it looks like for us is a lot of API integrations for one, kind mm-hmm. of, we, we use Salesforce. Um, so where we can, integrating into all of the advertising platforms that we have, be it, you know, programmatic, custom marketing, the software with with Salesforce and really just get, we've got the infrastructure set up. Now it's all about kind of evolving how we market to customers in particular, you know, really, really cranking up the the kind of automations and hyper-personalized customer journeys, which are multi-channel. And that takes a lot of time. There's a hell of a lot of scenarios which you can um which you can map out depending on how far you go with personalization. You know, you kind of look at the obvious low-hanging fruit stuff like lapsing customers and people about to drop out of your kind of core base. But then with your active base, you know, think about all of the different things, particularly in our world, wine, um, you know, how personalized you can be, you know, red, white preference, you know, country yeah. preference, um, all sorts of things. So plug in emails to that, plug in social media to that, plug in website personalization to that. All of a sudden, you've got a huge amount of uh, demand on your design team, um, the marketeers and kind of saying on those journeys. So it's really exciting. We're, we're, um, it's taken us a while to get our heads around it, but the good mm-hmm. news is that we, you know we, we, we've got the setup. We've, we've made really good good strides the past past year in particular. Um, but we've just got to just keep cranking up now and moving into more just kind of automated hyper personalized space, which is which is the direction of travel. And that is all driven by what you do with first party data, really. Yeah, absolutely. If I was to ask you how far along in your journey are you, how would you even quantify that? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I could I could probably fluff an answer, but yeah, I think the easiest one to the easiest thing to respond to that is probably yeah, it's never done, is it? You kind of alluded to earlier, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's a dangerous place when you think you're done and you finish things, or you or you've completed it, or you know. Are you far enough into the journey to be able to see a discernible difference, you know, in your performance marketing? So so have you seen significant improvements, you know, from at least from the segments or audiences that you are able to sort of hyper personalize towards? Versus yeah. those that you haven't, you haven't gotten there yet. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I think we we absolutely have got some positive use cases and and, and case studies which which have highlighted really impressive sort of ROI and and um, sort of in, in, increased response rates, all that kind of stuff. Particularly when it comes to website personalization, that's been the the one area where we've probably made the quickest and and most obvious financial benefits. Yeah, we've still got a long way to go with the longer term view of things in terms of overall customer based metrics such as lapse rates and and sort of conversion rates and all that kind of stuff but we are increasingly finding in individual kind of case studies which almost prove that we're headed in the right direction which is which is positive to see and i bet i bet those are invaluable to take to you know the board or, or the sort of leadership teams where you need investment to demonstrate the, the sort of the case for further investment continued investment and focus on these areas yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we've got a pretty pretty stringent uh, process when it comes to to investment. So we we it, it took us a long time to pitch the the evolution which we're going through really and get sign off on the investment required in order to to get there. You know that took the best part of twelve months alone. You know speaking to all of the kind of you know tech companies such as Salesforce and 
they're working out kind of use cases, forecasting their financial benefits, the ROI on the investment that you make. So yeah, that was obviously critical in the first That's instance, it. getting it signed off. But since then, yeah. you know, the pressure's on, right, what's this doing, guys? Yeah, <laughs> come and come and tell it's me. It's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Right now. yeah, yeah, and and you know that's 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 our responsibility. You know, we've, we've got to, we, we've got to prove the results, and yeah, we, we're good at doing that when, when we have the right case studies to pitch at least. Anyway, and that's interesting actually because that's a it's a really nice segue into what I was going to ask about, which is essentially, I mean, as you know, my question is kind of twofold. One is, was getting you know executive buy in a big challenge um it sounds like it, i think that's a fairly common challenge i don't think any anyone you know in your position is going to just go to their exec board and they say to them yeah how much do you need it's, you know there's going to be a lot of work to, that you need to put in to get that sort of mm-hmm. uh, green light so so i was going to ask around how you did that but i think you've mentioned it's you know around building building sort of roi models with some of the tools you know some of the prospective partners at the time i suspect you know before maybe they were on board it's like okay well let us know if we were to bring you on board Salesforce, what could we recognize in terms of performance improvements with your tech? Is that is that how you went about creating the case? It is, yeah. Um, I'd, I'd say one of the challenges that, that you have as well, and, and, and many organizations will experience the, the same, is, is the kind of cultural shift is, that is required as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, shifting from a certain way of doing things to a mm-hmm. very... Mm-hmm. contemporary approach which is you're almost kind of letting the data do its thing and and, yeah. and you bring it all together you're moving away from sort of campaign planning more into automation territory it's mm. quite a big change particularly if you're you know when, when you have senior people who have been in the business for for many years and are, and are kind of used to, to to doing certain things you know that, that there's a lot of kind of internal processes to go through and 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 kind of explanations as to to the why we should be doing things as well so that that in my yeah it, it, as mentioned that's kind of been um a key theme of my role actually being being brought in primarily to to accelerate digital um marketing transformation you know as much as i've had to pitch the financial gains of what we want to do you know, strategically there's been a, there's a big part of that has actually been getting internal buying as well and, and, and bringing kind of departments closer together and, and more unified in approach because, you know, digital marketing can't operate on their own as a, as a kind of entity. You know, there's so many moving parts. You buy with IT, design, kind of direct response marketers, you know, e-commerce managers, all that kind of stuff. So that has been of equal importance to the, to the core financial forecasting and planning. Yeah, yeah, I can well imagine. And it's, and you might not be able to answer this because it might be a, a very difficult question. But if you had to say there was one thing that was the most useful tool in, in your toolbox to get buy in, what would you say that was, that was? In terms of signing off investment? Yes. Let's get to the number things. <laughs> I mean, the most obvious thing which comes to mind is being able to coherently and convincingly pitch return on investment. I think that's fundamentally the most important thing for any board CEO to consider. Yeah. yeah. Why should I give you X, you know, hundred thousand of pounds? What is that going to deliver? And, and the ability to be able to, you know, structure and break that down and put together a plan which 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 will ultimately kind of reassure so it's kind of, yeah uh, yeah it's, it's always going to be roi for me i think and that's what that's what sort of executive leadership usually react to most isn't it let you, exactly. know, you show them essentially it's it's just you know demonstrating the numbers demonstrating the return on on their investment yeah uh, I mean, how long has this journey taken so far, first and foremost? I mean, you've probably been engaged in trying to do this digital transformation from when you first started, right? So you've yep. probably been at it minimum two years, probably three years at Virgin Wines. How long did it take you to be able to go back to the board and say, you remember what we, you know, what we talked about? You invested this. We're now able to demonstrate some, some wins you know, in this area, and this is what they look like. How long did that take? It was it was fairly fairly quick in certain areas. Okay, that's brilliant. Yeah, yeah I mean, in you know, if you if you take individual channels mm-hmm. as an example, so I think one of the one of, one of the more straightforward areas, yeah, yeah. which we have massively um, increased investment, and I've been able to kind of prove the return on that as being with search advertising. Yeah. That, that was a that was a real obvious one for me when I first when I first joined the company. That there was huge untapped potential there in terms of core commercial opportunities. And it's quite instantaneous 
search advertising you know you, you to you know it, it isn't it isn't a, a performance marketing platform yeah but if you do it right you can get really quick immediate kind of positive roi returns on it so that that's been the one area which we've done a really good job of actually kind of squeezing every every, every last kind of <laughs> performance based value out of it um and and our our investment in search advertising you know paid search shopping whatever it's gone up fivefold in in about three or four years because we've been able to kind of uh, prove in quite a direct response kind of way the mm-hmm. immediate kind of returns you can get and then with that comes kind of the broader spectrum of, of, of how you use search you know the display um, performance max increasingly is something which yeah. you're looking at so that's been quite a quite a, quite an interesting one where where it it requires a slightly longer term view is, is anything around kind of more brand marketing metrics uh, yeah 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 because we we are we're performance marketers ultimately mm-hmm. we invest primarily there we do and have tested a lot of things in the brand environment. So we, over the past couple of years, programmatic has been an area which we've looked at a lot. But because the metrics are obviously massively different, you have to have a you know a mid to longer term view of the impact that that has, and that's been slightly more challenging to demonstrate value and therefore increasing investment over time. So I think that is still an ongoing discussion that you know I'm always having with with JR CEO, um, and I rightly get challenged on. On the returns of programmatic and it is fundamentally this a, it's, a, it's a more difficult question to answer particularly when you're in an environment where, where the focus is pretty much not solely but primarily on on performance-based stuff yeah. so it depends on the bucket in which it fills for many marketers i, I imagine that they'd say this is slightly more challenging to to present value yeah so obviously, you've, so you've been able to move the needle in terms of your performance spend significantly has your brand budgets or has your brand budget increased as well? Have you managed to do some of that work, or are you very much at the start of that the, the sort of brand work? And, and obviously, I mean, you know, we need to be cognizant. The Virgin name, very well known. The colours are very mm-hmm. clear. Everyone knows the branding, isn't it? You know, there's there's a huge mm-hmm. brand salience. So your job in terms of branding is probably, I'm not going to say easier, but from a, you know, if if you were a, a startup who's just starting out an e-commerce startup D 2 C, you'd have a different branding challenge. So how how has that journey been for you then in terms of trying to you know leverage more and ha- actually and have you been able to prove you know have you seen that brand budgets support performance budget? Yeah, I think I think we we have in certain use cases one campaign which is um, which I remember using as the first sort of case of kind of the broader impact of of, of brand led marketing and how it can have a knock on effect for our channels was with our um, I don't know if you. You've seen them before. Advent calendars. We have a wine advent calendar, which which comes out every year. But I think we're the first ones in the UK to do it. But that's a huge campaign for us. Yeah, it's a multi-million pound yeah. product, and and with that comes kind of naturally more awareness-led activity, more brand engagement stuff. Mm-hmm. So that was actually a really good use case to dig down into. You know, the investment in in you know YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, video advertising, um, and all that kind of stuff, and just having a look at in quite a granular level of detail the knock-on effect that that has for customer acquisition, broadly speaking. Mm-hmm. You know, we saw big uplifts in certain areas. So that's been quite good. So using isolated campaigns, case study has been effective. But um, we, as mentioned, are performance led, but our business model is a really successful one. You know, we're very profitable. Yeah. Fair enough, we, we, we might not have the revenues that some of our competitors do, but our profit is, is industry leading. Yeah. And that doesn't come through, and that comes from a really, really sort of careful approach to what you spend. We do and have invested in brand, but I think we're up against far bigger brand marketing budgets. So we're always kind of, particularly when it comes to TV and, and stuff like that, most of us in the online wine industry now have invested in, 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 in TV, linear TV and on demand as well. So it's kind of a case at the moment of, of when's right to strike. But we are, we are certainly exploring what brand marketing can look like for us on a grander scale than maybe what it is now. Yeah, yeah. I'd yeah. probably say watch this space on that one. Yeah, oh, great. Well, that's... Uh... I mean, it's, it's an iterative process, isn't it? I mean, I think yeah. I think that's what I'm hearing is that it's small small wins to demonstrate pros, or prospect or potential to then mm-hmm. leverage you know, greater greater budgets, right? Exactly. I mean, we we, we are get, we are gearing ourselves up for it. And I think um, again, one thing which which I which I get challenged on a lot is, is attribution and yeah, 
and that's it that's an area which which i've been looking at a lot the past two yeah. years investing in in sophisticated attribution models which can really help demonstrate the wider impact of, of multi-channel marketing so that that's critical really for any business i think is ready to kind of really invest in sort of above the line or you know above, above and beyond kind of more performance led stuff and hopefully providing a platform which we will feel more comfortable moving forward to, to invest on a greater scale in, in, in more brand led stuff outside yeah. of performance-based metrics and it's a very difficult area to navigate it's you know i think attribution is also in in massive flux as well um mm. you know, people You're right. talking about mta becoming less relevant etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. but how you know without again without mentioning any of the specifics that that you that you can't or, or would rather not how do you approach the attribution work what, what does that look like you know on a day-to-day basis for you um, so we we are moving into kind of click tag territory. You kind of you kind of hinted at it. You know, it's difficult at the moment with, 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 the, with the changing environment that we find mm-hmm. ourselves in. But we yeah we are using central ad server tech as as the focal point, which then feeds into kind of data systems. Which um, I think we we use a model called a shapely shapely model. Okay. Do not ask me what that means. Uh, <laughs> that's a lot of crazy equations yeah so it's, it's kind of like predictive based stuff which we're looking at as well and and you know it, it provides you on the basis that you get a quick um you know full path to purchase um so that in a, in a very top line sense is, is what we're looking at at the moment so it's, it's kind of plugging all of your your advertising and and, and kind of marketing channels through a central ad serving piece of technology mm-hmm. back out again using one of the click data to there yeah we, we have a team which um we outsource that actually we have, a, we have a team who manages that entirely for us yeah, I was going to ask, actually, are things like the attribution piece, looking at the measurement, you know, around brand versus performance and all that, all that sort of good stuff. Do you do that internally or do you, because obviously you've got a team of five, so there's only so much you can do, right? It, or is that where yeah. you leave? It's a, it's, a, it's a separate team. So I, I guess the, the team of five is, is the kind of like my, my, my immediate, yeah. yeah, my immediate sort of, you know, line management responsibilities and yeah. all that. But there are many other departments um, under the umbrella of marketing and version wines of which we're a part of. Um, yeah, we're, we're very good, you know, data warehousing, being able to communicate across the business in detail things like lifetime value, lapse rates, you know, movements within the customer base. And, and we are very thorough, particularly in the last clip sense which is kind of primarily how we still operate, given that we've traditionally been a direct response marketing business, which makes it easier in some ways to to report in in the back end. The only area where we are currently outsourcing is with this kind of more sophisticated multi-touch point attribution. I mean, you know, speaking to sort of operating models almost, having a lot of those teams, the data teams, et cetera, internally probably really helps, doesn't it? Because you've got that sort of connection. They understand Mm. the business. They sit in the building. Is that is that a is that a model that you would recommend? Is that I mean has that helped the transformation? One hundred percent. Yeah, they they particularly moving forward. They, they yeah they, they they are invaluable for for any marketer really to make the right decision. Yeah, um, and, and and really take things up from I, I guess kind of advertising platform metrics to kind of core business financial metrics. You know, and, and just taking everything up up a notch in terms of efficiency and, and returns. So yeah, we we are really focusing more and increasing the sort of to, togetherness and an approach to internal kind of data sharing across all areas of the business, which is really invaluable to make um, broader strategic calls on, mm. on where we should be investing, particularly around cost per acquisition and, and, and kind of, you know, affordable CPAs based on channel, all of the, all of the data, which we get fed in by, by our data guys, you know, we can, we can do it without them essentially, you know, yeah. we can make strategic decisions. Okay. How much are we willing to pay for a new customer on Google shopping versus say, Facebook, because the lifetime value metrics actually differ quite substantially. Therefore, you have different allowable CPAs, um, fully costed new customers, all that kind of stuff. So if companies don't have an in-house data team, I would strongly recommend investing. No, this is what we're trying to uncover, isn't it? It is yeah. practice. Uh, and Nathan suggests that you should get your data team internally. 100%. Um, it sounds like a very data-led and very sort of, I say scientific, but you know what I mean by that, um, mm-hmm. operation that you're running. You're really focusing on doing smart things it's a very kind of uh you know as i say data-led culture where do you think marketing isn't kind of leading more at the board table within your world you have the almost like i'd say the luxury that whatever happens in marketing directly impacts revenue right which Mm -hmm. obviously impacts profits which obviously impacts the business how important is it on on you know at the boardroom and does it have a seat in in those kind of key business decision decisions or does it almost you know sit in silo 
okay, this is marketing, it's a cost center. What's the approach or what's the sort of the sentiment towards marketing internally? I'd say it's pretty integral, to be honest, and always has been in terms of board level decision making. As, as kind of alluded to earlier, uh, talking about, you know, the, the the what COVID brought in terms of uncertainty and, you know, it has been pretty central in my experience. I don't think you can have a business strategy without a marketing strategy. The two are too interlinked for me, because otherwise you're just kind of picking numbers out of thin air and, and not really working out how you're going to get there. It is it, it's, 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 it's as important as a business strategy, I'd say, marketing. But then I would say that's unbiased. <laughs> <laughs> but it, but it does it does sound like the business agrees with you on that. Yeah, I think so. Like Jay, our CEO, he, I mean, he he loves marketing. He finds all areas of marketing, all areas of business fascinating. When you have a character like that, it makes things easier because he has a, a, a genuine interest in everything that you're doing in a marketing sense. So quite fortunate in that degree that he has that level of interest and openness to everything that we do and he's very trusting if you if you pre-value and, and let you do your thing and he'll always ask you know and, and, and the same goes with the other directors at Virgin Wines you know, we, 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 me as a team and other areas within marketing and data we're always being asked for the latest insight and analysis in order for them to make decisions you know strategic decisions so in in, in my experience in my time at Virgin Wines it's been integral so, agency side is different however yeah. so I did I was an agency prior to Virgin Wines and I think the frustrations which I had working for clients is that marketing often wasn't given the, the bandwidth at the board table as you as you kind of mentioned it was it was seen as a cost sort of you know oh we've got to do it sort of thing or if our brand's a bit fluffy why should we bother doing that you know proposition blah 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 blah, blah. so it, it kind of varies I guess in, in the kind of sector and environment in which you're working in. So absolutely, if you were to ask me four or five years ago the same question, I'd probably have a very different answer to one you just gave. I just gave it on Virgin Wine. Yeah, and I'm sure every organization is very different, right? So what I'm what I'm sort of hearing almost as a summary to, to that is that having a good relationship with the board is is critical. When they're interested in marketing, that relationship becomes easier to, to foster. So trying to pick their interest in marketing in, in the trends and what's happening. And then obviously, which, which I think you've done brilliantly is just being data led, you know, lead with the numbers. Everyone understands numbers. They, they're not opinions. They're fairly objective. I mean, obviously, you know, we know that some of them are modeled, but they give the board something to really understand and really kind of hang their hat on to be able to understand, you know, to evaluate investment. It sounds to me like those are the three things that you've done exceptionally well. Yeah, I'd say so. And I think just being, being open and honest as well, Mm. You know, having mm. having quite not shying away from maybe quite difficult conversations and and and, and not being a yes person, nodding your head and you get, getting along with things. Because if you have access to data, or you you know, and you, and you or you have an opinion, strategically speaking, I mean, I've always find I've always found in my time that you're you're far better off communicating that with the CEO, the board, whoever. Don't you know, don't be afraid. They're there to be challenged as well. You know, you, I don't I don't think you can go through any kind of auditing process or situation analysis or or research transformations, whatever, unless you have people who are willing to drive change and be open and honest and have these difficult conversations and, and also kind of receptive board members and CEOs as well. And I've been definitely fortunate in that sense that the CEO of Virgin Wines has been very open to, to, to maybe slightly more difficult conversations. Excellent. I've got, I've got just two more questions for you, or rather, you know, what have been your biggest challenges in enacting change in, in, you know, pushing transformation forwards, you know, those challenges have been technical yeah, I th- I'd probably lean more towards buy-in from other other areas of the business, particularly when digital is, is is an unknown entity. I really enjoy that though, so it hasn't. It's been challenging but fun at the same time, you know. And I think that probably stems from my agency days, where you know you're you're, you're kind of brought in, aren't you, as expertise to help, and and I enjoy that, and and I've kind of trans- transitioned that into an in-house role. So that has been challenging. An example of that with you know coming into Virgin Wines and and have, and and kind of identifying the SEO is you know we had clear areas for improvement there, largely around the, the kind of technical infrastructure of our website and and just a lot of, you know a lot of basics which should be a quick wins and all that kind of stuff, but longer term implications and things to look at as well and 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 yeah maybe you get a little bit of defensiveness sometimes if you if you're challenging another department and, and being like okay guys you know have you looked at this why haven't you looked at this what can we do to to get to here all that kind of stuff and and that's perfectly natural I mean that's just human nature I think if if someone new comes in yeah. Yeah. and starts pointing the finger you know and, and, and to a degree we probably will react the same so I think the the, the way in which you approach change 
is as important as the change itself in terms of what you're actually suggesting you do rather than going in all guns blazing being the big i am uh, i'm brilliant let's do this let's do that you've got to be aware of, of, of personalities and the way things have been before your time being aware of that and, and working through those things so, yeah that's, that's certainly so it's been a, a challenge but an enjoyable one and technically what have been the biggest challenges so from a from an ad tech market perspective maybe maybe getting set up at the speed required to really get the most out of really hyper personalized multi-channel customer marketing campaigns basically that that we weren't ready for that and that took it that took a bit of time to to get there because there, there are many implications of that in all areas of marketing and it that piece of work addresses a number of different parts of the business doesn't it so, so exactly you have to move at the at the sort of speed of this you know the slowest department almost isn't it Exactly. Yeah, you, you need a lot of platforms to talk to each other and sing in harmony, and um, that that that's been a big learning curve actually. Just the breadth of if you are to really go for that, what that actually entails and what it requires, because it is it is it is a lot. You know, it's a lot. It's a lot more complicated than maybe some other areas of digital transformation which a business can go. I almost I almost feel like that that area is very easy to underestimate. Yep, I would agree. Hundred percent. On paper, it's like okay, we just do this stuff, and and this happens <laughs> yeah. at the end. But then when you get to do that stuff, and someone says to you, "Well, this doesn't speak to this," and like, why? Because yeah. we got to do this first. And you're like, oh, okay. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. It's like this box that just keeps, you know, the gifts to keep on giving, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, you got all sorts jumping out the box. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree yeah. at that point. I think what what's really interesting for me is that you know it's no good just having someone in a transformational kind of position who knows the technical aspect, who's able to, to sort of project manage, et cetera, et cetera. I think it's, you know, it feels to me like more and more we're having to get the right people in there who are sort of, who have the right kind of emotional intelligence almost as well, to be able to kind of traverse a number of different departments, have different conversations with different people, get people on board, understand and see the signs of when people are, you know, when you're having to kind of, you know, navigate around people's egos or people's kind of legacy you know, things and, and, and sentiment, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, for me, that's really interesting. It's just becoming such a, a holistic ask, isn't it? it you know, it's, yeah, you it need is. to be so many different people in one person to get the thing done. Yeah, um, totally agree. Yeah, you must, you must have seen a lot of it in your time doing what you did. We see, yeah, we see a lot of it and we see, we see a lot of it not quite working out as well because, you know, because you get the you know, people who are very technical, but they're not very good at... Mm getting people who they don't necessarily directly manage right so mm-hmm. you know you're not you know none of these people are accountable to you you've just got to get mm-hmm. them on side it's a really good point it's, it's that accountability thing isn't it you know because when when there isn't that sort of clear line of oh, yeah. i'm doing this you're doing that it is, it is tricky excellent um one more question is you know do you have a favorite wine are you are you a big wine drinker nathan i joined the company liking it but not knowing what i was drinking and i think yeah. probably quite a few people would be in a similar boat the really good thing about beige wines is that they put you through uh w set level two which is a which is a wine wow. qualification exam um when you first join and that takes a few months to to do and that just gives you that base level understanding so you know you can go into a supermarket and not be complete well not not, not that you would yeah, i'll take that back you'd obviously go online and buy from virgin wines so you can understand what you're actually um, buying, and that's been yeah. that's really important actually. And yeah, since since I've learned more about wine, yeah, I've, it's just been great fun exploring it. But if I was to choose one thing, I'm a big fan of Italian red wines. Generally speaking, they're quite they're quite quite rich and full bodied, quite like the rustic rich style. So they, yeah, that's that's probably where I'd go. Maybe not on a day like today, which is very beautiful and sunny. English wine is very good, you know. Um, I heard I heard this coming up right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 it's growing. We, we give the um, French champagne houses a run for their money. So if you haven't tried it yet, I'd highly recommend. Excellent. Excellent. What a, what a lovely note to end on. Thank you very much, Nathan. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you, mate. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. All the best. Thanks for tuning in to Time for a Reset Inside Marketing Transformation. We have a great lineup of guests coming onto the show. If you're a new listener, subscribe and follow CVE on LinkedIn to make sure you don't miss an episode. I'll see you on the next one.